like to uh, officially welcome everyone to this morning's webinar. My name is Leanne LaRange and I'm speaking to you today from Edmonton. And I would like to begin today's meeting by acknowledging that Physiotherapy Alberta's <coughs> offices are located on Treaty 6 territory and on Métis Region 4, which is the home and has been the home of many Indigenous peoples since time immemorial. Physiotherapy Alberta recognizes that Indigenous peoples have been healing people on this land long before settlers arrived. We commit ourselves to upholding the spirit and intent of the treaty agreements between Indigenous peoples and settlers and the underlying principles of peace, friendship and understanding. We recognize that we are all on a journey of reconciliation and we commit ourselves to helping all people to move forward in their journey towards a good life. We recognize that people from across Alberta and beyond are joining us today and we encourage you to take a few moments to learn more about the lands, peoples and treaties with which you may be in relationship. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce this morning's presenter, Shenda Tanchak, has 25 years of experience in the regulatory sector. She is an experienced leader both in appointed and elected positions. In addition to working as a CEO and registrar of the College of Physiotherapists of Ontario, Shenda was president of the Federation of Health Regulatory Colleges of Ontario and chair of a Pan-Canadian Registrar's Committee. Shenda began working as a consultant in the professional regulation sector in 2019. Before beginning her consulting practice as she and her chief executive role, Shenda had worked as an investigator, complaints committee manager, and policy manager, director, and senior advisor. She has extensive experience in working closely with boards, helping them to maximize performance outcomes at the individual member and collective level. And before her career in regulation, Shenda practiced law and worked in advertising and public relations. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Shenda Tanchuk. Over to you. Thanks, Leanne. That intro makes me sound like I must be 220 years old. So I'm glad that you can't see me, people. Um, I wanted to thank you for the land acknowledgement too, Leanne. It was a particularly nice one. You know, we're getting used to hearing these at the beginning of every meeting, and sometimes they seem meaningless, and sometimes they seem like the person reading them is thinking about the words. I've just come back. I, I'm speaking to you from a small town in Ontario, and I've just come back from a trip out west. I um, went to high school and university in Alberta, and I visited my mom in Alberta, and then I visited my in-laws in BC. So I was on the island, and I was in Vancouver. And the Indigenous presence was very much there in in all of those locations. And the more we think about it in this terrible time of health crisis, I think the more the idea of a continuum of healing and learning from each other resonates with me. So I'd just like to add my acknowledgement to yours. We're kind of talking about the antithesis of that, aren't we? Because the idea of a continuum of healing by people who learned from each other and practiced without oversight is the exact opposite of professional regulation. Uh, but that's what we're here to talk about, in particular self-regulation, because that's what physiotherapists presently enjoy. But I'm going to walk you through some alternatives as well. So let's dig in. I, I like to start by reminding us all that regulation is just another kind of consumer protection and there are different levels of consumer protection and the government generally um, thinks of this as its responsibility. So at the federal level, you see consumer protection laws that protect people from dangerous products. And I've got life jackets and paint up there, but maybe the more uh, relevant example is pharmaceutical products that we know require federal level approval before they can be sold to consumers. At the provincial level, the consumer protection laws tend to be about businesses and consumer transactions. So you remember, maybe you are too young to remember, but I remember for sure all of the legislation around protecting people from gyms. So can I, if I sign up for a gym, am I locked in immediately? Can I think about it for 24 hours? That's provincial level legislation designed to protect consumers from bad actors, car dealers, travel agencies, those businesses that have to have licenses to act or restaurants 
those are all provincial level consumer um, protection laws. Occupational regulations, those usually live at the provincial level as well, and they protect consumers from people who provide services. So I've got engineers and dentists here, but um, usually real estate agents fall into this category, all kinds of health professionals, although not all of them. So it's just occupational regulation is just one more kind of consumer protection. When we think about how we regulate occupation, so people who do jobs, there's a whole range of risk that they present to the people they provide services to. And we see a range of regulatory responses that is commensurate with the risk. So the very lowest risk occupation, uh, let's say, gosh, you know, I was going to use gymnastics teacher, which is a job that my daughter had for a long time, but that's actually pretty high risk, isn't it? So let's think about, um, oh, people who work in stores. That's a pretty low risk occupation. If you're looking at the slide, let's put it right at the greenest end of that arrow. And if you go down to the blue arrow, you see market competition slash no regulation. So for people who choose to work in stores, or the, I'm thinking about the clerk at the drive through McDonald's, there's no rules about who can do that except the rules that the employers put on. So that's market regulation. There's no provincial interference about who's allowed to do that job. Some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, what about um, food service handling regulations? Those are an interesting piece. They regulate the business, not the individual. So the business is required to only hire people to provide food services who have particular training, but that's, off, that's regulating the business. When we talk about regulating people, it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship between the regulator and the regulated, which might sound pretty familiar to you. Along that continuum, along the blue line across the bottom, you see lots of other different kinds of things. Voluntary certification, certification and inspection, um, voluntary registration, occupational licensure, and self-regulation. So voluntary reg registration looks like a pure association model when there is no um, regulatory body involved and it's not a requirement to enter into the practice that you belong. So right now, physiotherapy assistants who belong to the physiotherapy assistants or to the, to the CPA are voluntarily registered. There's no requirement for them to be registered to do their job. You though, as physiotherapists, are all the way over there in the red zone and you fall into self-regulation. So the more the world thinks that your interactions with patients or consumers might create risk of harm, the higher the level of oversight needs to be. A few years ago, Ontario was looking at how self-regulation worked in the healthcare sector and whether it was important or maybe its time had come. And this they pulled together this sort of uh, think tank of people from all walks of life, lots of patients and hospital workers and healthcare providers, and regulators and government people were there. And the statement that came out of that forum was this one, that the regulation and oversight of health professionals, that includes you, is an important mechanism to make sure patients get the highest quality care possible while mitigating to the extent possible the risks of harm that might be associated with provision of healthcare services. It's reassuring to know that the government, or rather that this think tank, believes that regulation continues to be relevant for those two pieces, to protect people from harm. And that harm can be um, somebody who hasn't, isn't properly trained and doesn't have the diagnostic skills, or somebody who um, is negligent and doesn't take proper care and lets the patient fall, whatever kind of harm there might be gives them 
um, bad non-scientific advice about something outside scope of practice, that's the protecting the patient side. But when we look at the positive side, receiving the highest quality care possible, that's the other side of regulation. That's you as a member of a profession participating in webinars like this or in any other way you interact with Physiotherapy Alberta to ensure that all your colleagues meet the same standards of care that you do to boost the whole profession. I want to get a little lawyerly on you just now. Self-regulation is the idea of the occupational group entering into an agreement with the government to formally regulate the activities of its members. So basically what that means is there's an exchange that takes place. We are allowed to regulate ourselves because we promise to meet some obligations. And here are some of the bits of it. So the government gives you restricted practice. So folks who are not licensed physiotherapists are not allowed to engage in physiotherapy. The government gives restricted title. You're only allowed to call yourself a physical therapist or a physiotherapist if you are properly registered with a regulatory body. And it gives you autonomy, more or less, to decide who gets a license, who loses a license, and what the standards of practice can be. Those rules you're allowed to set on your own as a profession. In exchange for those authorities, those gifts from the government, the profession offers qualified registrants, standards about ethics and practice, a mechanism that manages complaints and discipline, and quality assurance or continuing competence. So those are the two sides of this contract that the profession has entered into with the government. Here's a really critical piece, especially as Physiotherapy Alberta and the other uh, health professions in Alberta who are making the transition from the dual mandate, the combined association regulator model to the separate mandate. Professional regulation does have some benefits for the profession. As I said, um, reserved title and reserved practice but its raison d'etre is to protect the public, not to enhance the status of the profession. It is so hard to keep a grip on what exactly that means because lots and lots of times things that are good for the public are also going to be good for the profession. But when you think about the bottom line reason that a rule is being made or an action is being taken by the regulator, if it doesn't primarily benefit the public, it's probably not appropriate. Here's what associations do that are different than what the regulator can do. In serving the interests of their members, they provide networking opportunities, they publish information of interest, they conduct research, they stage conferences, seminars, and workshops, they maintain job boards, they negotiate preferential rates for things like insurance, uh, and they lobby governments to influence policy in furtherance of the interests of their members. So here's a place where I said that it gets tricky, that division between the regulator and the association. Let's look at this last bullet, this lobby the government bullet, and think about um, scope of practice in particular. So in Ontario, when I was the registrar of that physio college, we were engaged in discussions about whether physiotherapists should be able to order x-rays. And the scope of practice was promised to be expanded to permit that, but it wasn't happening. From the regulator's point of view, we could argue that we could demonstrate through evidence that physiotherapists 
already had the appropriate training to do this, so they were safe to do it, and that the public would benefit from this because it would, it would, you know, it was a little hard to argue, I think, that it would improve the quality of care, but it would certainly improve turnaround time and it would likely reduce costs to the system if people didn't have to have two separate appointments in order to get that diagnostic test done that would inform the care provided by the physiotherapist. So in that case, it's certainly true that it would benefit physiotherapist practice if they could order x-rays, but we could make a strong argument that it would be for the benefit of the public as well. So we felt okay to do that. Some scopes of practice arguments, though, the Ministry of Health in Ontario, at least, came down pretty hard on some colleges for trying to expand scopes. So this one's a particularly touchy area. In the case with respect to diagnostic imaging, we um, worked with the association in order to approach government and have those conversations. Just raising this to show you that it can be a gray area the most important test is who gets the most out of this, the public or the profession. And if the answer is the profession, the best thing to do is ask the association to take that on. So one of the things that we hear a lot about is whether the public believes that self-regulation works or whether it's, a, it's a, a cliche, but I'm going to use it even though it doesn't quite fit in a profession that has historically been dominated by women. Is the physiotherapy regulator a public interest organization or is it really an old boys network? You can see this loss of trust across a whole range of occupational regulation. The BC College of Teachers was disbanded in 2012 because of loss of trust. And how come? Most of the decisions that were being made there were found to be made for the benefit of teachers and not for the public. So there was a huge bias. Um, I'm interested in these, these two uh, clippings that I've got here on the right about the Ontario skills trade body. So. A handful of years ago, the government set up a new college that was regulating all the skilled trades, carpenters, auto repair, all like that. And after the Ford government came into power, they stopped doing inspections and they stopped taking action against businesses that were using trades people who didn't have certification. That now has been shut down because again, of lack of trust. They just weren't doing their job to protect the public. This one's interesting too. We all hear about Vancouver's real estate prices and how insane they are. This um, entity, Money Sense, identified ineffective regulation as one of the causes of escalating real estate prices. So what they found was that Vancouver real estate agents who were disciplined for wrongdoing got fines and suspensions that were so minuscule compared to the benefit of the wrongdoing that it was no deterrent from bad behavior at all. When you, when you think about something as central to people's lives as real estate prices, as soon as somebody starts to blame the self-regulating body for the cause of that, it, it, it starts to take on um, a more dramatic character, doesn't it? More though, why should lawyers be allowed to regulate themselves? So this article is, is about how there's this historic basis that doesn't make sense in the modern world. Once upon a time, lawyers were meant to be serving the court system. They were meant to be impartial. They worked on behalf of a client, but they're primary duty was to truth and justice. And as we believe that's receded, we start to look at self-regulation and whether it makes sense in that context. 
The Quebec Order of Engineers was placed under trusteeship in 2016. And the reason there is kind of interesting. So the regulator, the um, board of directors has an AGM. And what they tell the membership is, we can't do our job unless we raise fees significantly. We can't do inspections. We can't do quality assurance. We need more money. And at the AGM, they defeat that resolution. They don't agree to raise fees. So there is the regulator, hamstrung, unable to do the job that he, that it was created to do, and unable to move forward because they needed to raise fees, and the government had to intervene. On the left, you see a report from CBC about a review of all of BC's health professional colleges. So. I don't know how much you care about self-regulation at the higher level, but a couple of years ago, what happened in BC was this review by this fellow in the front of the picture with, I guess I, I was going to say with the purple tie and the glasses, but there are two of them. Perhaps that's the uniform that they have to wear. Anyway, um, they came in and they looked at the number of colleges that existed in BC. I can't remember how many that was in the 20s, low 20s, and they felt that some of them were doing a poor job, some of them were doing a great job, but it didn't make sense at all for them to all run their own separate shows and all deal with the same kinds of registration and standard development and complaints and discipline issues as separate entities. So they recommended collapsing them into three or four colleges, I think, actually, I think it's six. It doesn't really matter too much except to say that they found so many fundamental flaws in the way that the system was organized that they recommended reducing the number of colleges and merging some. So OT and PT, um, massage therapy, I think, and a handful of others are all going to become one college in BC. That legislation is presently being written. On the right is the report from that think tank I talked about in Ontario. Now, major changes like have happened in BC have not happened yet in Ontario, although we're still waiting to see what will happen out my way. Um, certainly the recommendation of merging colleges was one of the things that came out of, of that think tank as well. So how come? Why is it that the public is interested in this at all? And what can we do about it? So when you think back to the BC real estate price example that I gave, the first bullet, failure to protect, um, clicks with that, right? If the regulator has um, a role to play in keeping prices down and nobody can afford to live in Vancouver anymore. That's a failure of the regulators to protect the consumer. You think about the headlines that you've seen in the past um, about the failure by the College of Physicians and Surgeons to protect patients from sexual abuse by doctors. Same thing, failure to protect. The second bullet is the lack of meaningful measurements or proof of efficacy. So this one is starting to gain traction all around the world. How can regulators prove that they do anything at all? That's super hard. If you think about your own patients and you think, how can I prove that I have been effective or useful, you want to talk about the harm that didn't happen. You want to say, well, in they, their, their recovery from surgery was not six weeks, it was only four weeks. And you can kind of look to statistics from other situations to try and bolster that, but it's super hard to prove the absence of a bad thing. And that's kind of how it is for measurement about the value of self-regulation. 
all of the patients who didn't get hurt because we did our job is a difficult thing to prove. But regulators are starting to be called on to prove that they're useful. The next bullet is lack of public engagement. So there's this idea that regulators are out there working away at their stuff without asking what patients really want. And that's become more and more concerning to the people who are already doubtful about regulators. Concerns about whether all workers are being used to their fullest capacity. This is an interesting one connected with scope of practice. So in relation to physiotherapy, if you think about um, how regulation enables or prevents assistance from being used to their fullest capacity, you can see the concern. So healthcare costs get higher and higher, but regulation stands in the way of people getting access to care from those who are unregulated. If kinesiologists are really well trained, can I get my physiotherapy care from a kin? I am the last person to suggest that that would be appropriate. But that is another of the con concerns that the public have about regulation. And how about unregulated risky people? I don't know if you saw the headline a few years ago um, about dental care being provided in, I think it was somebody's basement in Vancouver by a non-dentist. So it was somebody who had never qualified for dentistry in British Columbia, but they were performing dental services. And then in Ontario, we had a horrible um, lab thing where unqualified lab workers were responsible for infections because their premises weren't sterile. So it's an interesting thing that the government gives you, the, the regulatory body, the authority to uh, take actions only with respect to the people who are regulated, but the public blames you whenever someone who is unregulated causes harm. And the last one is registrant hostility. So the more, um, the more that members of the regulatory body are angry with or resist the rules uh, imposed by the regulator, and the more they stand up and object out loud, the more the public wonders about whether the regulator is doing a good job. So what can happen if the public is so concerned that, the, that Physiotherapy Alberta is doing a good enough job to qualify physios make sure that they maintain their qualifications or, or training throughout their lifetime and make sure that the bad apples are rooted out or retrained. The, the public starts to really think you're doing a crummy job. What can happen? The first bullet talks about what's already happening. Um, meta regulation, some people call it. I just call it watchdogs. So these are um, government imposed restrictions on how a regulator chooses to do its business. Labor mobility is one. So the government didn't trust regulators to trust each other to give licenses if you wanted to move to a different province. So they created low labor mobility laws. Fair practices legislation. So that's fairness, fairness commissioner who looks at registration practices to make sure that internationally educated professionals get a fair consideration uh, in, in registration application processes. Some jurisdictions now have an ombudsman, ombudsperson, or even in Ontario, a patient ombudsperson uh, to deal with issues that the public feels the regulator's not doing a good enough job about. And then sometimes oversight bodies. So in BC, the BC Professional Governance Act introduced an oversight body that tells some regulators how to do their job in a really strict way. 
So those are not health regulators. They're engineers and engineering techs and agrologists and a handful of other sort of building and dirt uh, related occupations. And this oversight body dictates how they should do their business. In the UK, healthcare has an oversight body called the Professional Standards Authority that tells the regulators how to do their business. Another thing that might happen is amalgamation. That's like I just talked about happening right now in BC. Or loss of self-regulation. So the BC Teachers College in 2012, uh, the Real Estate Council of BC in 2016, and there are some other examples across Canada as well. So do we care? I think we do. Um, I'm not a health professional, so why do I care? When I think about who is most competent to make a decision about whether a physiotherapist met the standard of care, did the right thing, I think that another physiotherapist or a group of physiotherapists is better qualified to figure that out than the government is. Um, when I think about whether what kind of continuing education requirements should there be for physiotherapists to maintain the quality of their practice 20, 30 years after they've graduated from university, I feel better knowing that other physiotherapists are determining that than whether the government might set some rules. Now, that isn't because I don't trust my government. I kind of don't, but actually it's more because I think that there are so many details and specifics that people who are passionate about the regular or the, the professional body are the ones who are most likely to be paying attention. That only works if I sincerely believe that you have my best interest in mind. From the physiotherapist's point of view, why do you care? Well, let me tell you about the new regulatory regime for personal support workers in Ontario. They, um, they will be regulated, but it's not self-regulation. It's kind of between bullet number two and bullet number three. But here's the part that I think you should be concerned about. If somebody makes a complaint about a personal support worker in Ontario under this legislation, it looks like one individual, the CEO of the organization, gets to decide whether the complaint is valid or not. The um, personal support worker doesn't really have an appeal and doesn't have an opportunity to tell their side of the story. This is brand new legislation and maybe that it won't turn out to play out that way, but it looks to me like one person gets to make this life-altering decision about another person without any expert advice and without the person who's going to lose their license having an opportunity to really have fair treatment. Your regulatory body, Physiotherapy Alberta, guarantees fair treatment in registration decisions and in complaints and dis discipline decisions where, where it matters the most and in um, personal health care decisions to the incapacity decisions. So not only do you as a profession get to set the standards for entry to practice and, and for how you conduct your practice, but on a one-on-one -on -one basis, you stand to have fairer treatment in a self-regulating body. That's my opinion. So the alternatives to self-regulation do look like that, direct government regulation. So you think about your driver's license, that's direct government regulation. You go, you get a license, nobody looks at you again until you break a law and then maybe they take your license away and it goes to court and it's expensive. That's what direct government regulation could look like. Delegated authority, this is all tricky admin law, regulatory geek stuff that I don't expect you to care about. Only to say that that delegated authority model in introduces more government rules 
and fewer rules generated by the profession. So the example that I'm thinking about when I'm talking about them is the the Vintners Quality Association regulatory body here in Ontario. So they are the ones who um, decide whether wines meet the standard to enter into this VQA. So they regulate the wine industry. And the government has intervened to tell them who meets that standard because they're allowed to because it's not self-regulating which turns it all into political decisions right who lobbied the loudest to get their orange wine recognized this is an example not based wholly in in fact or evidence but i i raise it to show you what's at stake licensing or certification that is like um, driver's license is, is an example, but I'm thinking more about home inspectors. So home inspectors in British Columbia, they get their license once and, and they renew it every three years. So as it stands today, you a, a home inspector who say gets a great bribe from the, the vendor and says the house is perfect and the um, the person buying the house finds out afterwards that they lied. The only recourse is through the court system. But from a public protection point of view, that home inspector just stays licensed until their license expires. That's the licensing or certification model. The upside for them is there's no continuing education requirements. There's no, but no big brother looking over their shoulder. Voluntary registration is another example, and that's when you belong to an association, but there is no regulatory body that you're required to belong to. All of these are unlikely to confer restricted practice or restricted title. So how do you make sure that you get to have those benefits of self-regulation continue? You have to make sure that your regulatory body is has sound operational practices. So in other words, at the AGM, you look at the financial statements, you make sure that they're using the money properly. Performance measurement and accountability, you try to figure out a way, the, as a regulator, you try to figure out a way to demonstrate that you are running your shop efficiently and effectively and you are listening to registrants and you are listening to members of the public. You really got to make sure that you're focused on the public interest and not promotion of the profession. And that's what the new legislation in Alberta is all about, removing advocacy activities from regulators. Transparency, that goes for the way you make decisions the decisions you make and the decisions you make about individuals needs to be fully explained to build trust and increase public engagement. And again, I'll take you back to um, Bill 46 about that because it increased the number of members of the public or public representation on the board of your regulators to half and half. Now, I think that comes to the end. I'm hopeful that there are some questions. I realize I've sort of rushed through, um, but I'm more than happy to talk about some of these issues if there are any questions. So we'll just give the audience a few moments to type in any questions that they may have, but uh, while uh, while they're doing so, I, um, I'll just ask you a couple of questions that came to me. You know trying to look at this uh, from uh, a member's perspective as opposed to from a regulator's perspective, because obviously I'm interested in this topic, wearing both hats as a member of the profession as well as a member of the regulatory community. But uh, So I, I could go for hours with you, Shenda, but um, what I want to ask you about, right at the very beginning, and um, you talked about uh, the difference between regulation of an individual as opposed to regulation of um, of 
the business, and I think you were talking about food service workers at the time, and I, I wondered if you could give any insight as to why, um, why certain groups are regulated at the business level and other groups are regulated at the individual level, and I'm familiar, or at least I, my understanding is, like, for example, with pharmacy in Alberta, there's sort of two layers of regulation because they have regulated individuals, but then they also regulate pharmacies. So how does that decision get made or what factors into that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's a really tricky question. And I, <laughs> I want to just say politics. Um, so pharmacy and labs are examples of where the the premises is regulated as well as the individual. In most cases, you don't see both. You see one. So in restaurants, the business is regulated, but the individuals are not. I guess it might be the higher the risk, the closer the oversight. So going back to those arrows, that there's a sense that pharmacy um, and both of those, labs and pharmacies, have huge um, supply chain issues. So it it's the system that needs to be regulated. So I'm thinking about the cold chain for vaccines is a good example, right? You can regulate an individual pharmacist, but the person who delivered the um, vaccine to them has to be part of the chain to make sure it's safe. So that might be why. Now, one of the things that we know is that in the absence of oversight of the business, Practitioners are often pressured into doing things that are contrary to the rules and expectations of the regulator. You see that quite a lot in um, physiotherapy. So when you work for a for-profit business, if they happen to have a business model that requires a certain number of visits or a certain amount of time or reliance on um, personal trainers to a certain extent, it can compromise individual care decisions. I think that there is a public interest reason to regulate those businesses, but there seems to be no appetite to do so. Again, I think that's politics and money at the end of the day. Fair enough. Um, the next question uh, we had come in from Adam. He wanted to understand if regulation is based on risks, why do regulatory fees vary across the country? And, and I, I will talk to part two of this question in a second, but can you give us some insight into, into that or maybe into how how fees get set. I, uh, you know, you've you spent many years as the registrar at CPO. You would know in detail how that happens. So, can you give us any insight about risk and how that plays into fees? Yeah, it's so um, it's frustrating, right? As a registrant, it can be incredibly frustrating. So, the first answer is volume. All regulators have the same job to do, and if you're nurses and you have nurses in Ontario have something like three hundred thousand registrants. I, can that possibly be right? Anyhow, a really, really high number. So their job is the same as the job of the College of Midwives, which has 400 members. They have to do the registration, do the QA, have discipline hearing, create standards, have meetings of their board, all of that. Of course, it just makes sense that midwives have to pay a higher fee because you can't get the job done without it. The nursing fee is really low compared to most other health professionals. That's reason one. Reason two is there's a huge variation in the, I want to say, quality of the work that regulators do. Um, and that comes back to the fact that there's not really any performance measurement rules about this. So. If Physiotherapy Alberta decided to reduce their discipline costs, they wanted to reduce their membership fees, so they were going to reduce their discipline costs by never having another discipline hearing, no matter what the allegations were, that would be a way to do a bad job 
but also a way to reduce fees. And there isn't anybody watching that until it gets to the really bad state, like those engineers in Quebec, where they refuse to raise fees enough to do the job. So then, of course, there might be some regulators that do a bad job with money management. And again, it's really hard to tell if that's happening unless you're on the board. So it's a reason to run for election. I got to tell you, uh, I've at this point, I've probably worked with 20 regulators across Canada, and there aren't any that I think are wasting money like crazy. But but they think about their mandate differently. How much QA? How much support for our registrants? How many standards do we develop? Or how much is the association going to do and how much are we going to do in negotiating that? So those those things all have an impact on fees. Thanks for that answer, Shenda. And I would just point out that um, our, you had made a comment about AGMs and Physiotherapy Alberta doesn't have an AGM, uh, so that's not a venue for people to see the audited financial statements, but they are part of our annual report. and. Um, I believe, although I haven't checked, but I believe the most recent year's annual report was recently published on our website, so people can look there for that information. Um, and uh, Adam, just to answer part two of your question, I would point you back to a podcast that uh, was recently released by Physiotherapy Alberta with regards to exactly this question about where, do, where does the money go. So I'll, uh, I'll leave that, and I'm going to um, move on to uh, the next question. Interesting question uh, from Tammy. She asks, as a member of the public and a member of a professional association, how can I ensure the quality of the board or the council? How can I trust the nomination committee to not be an old boys network? Um, so how can uh, members of the profession or members of the public, how can they try to ensure the quality of the council and ensure that the council understands what its job is? Shenda? Oh, Tammy, I love that question so much. The, the, the problem with quality of boards is apathy of registrants. So as a registrant, you, you, you can attend board meetings and you can access board materials so you know what they're doing. It's really easy as a member of the audience to um, be critical and so it takes a little while to learn what is um, what what are the indicators of good decision making and bad decision making. But you want to make sure that you don't see bias and that you do see evidence in for the decisions that are being made. And you want to see good conduct happening at those meetings. So if you are watching a meeting where somebody on the board is a bully and other people aren't getting their say, that's a really strong indication that there's something really wrong with that board. Um, there are lots of people who are probably really smart who aren't participating in the decision making. That's a pretty simple one, but it's a good example. How do you fix it? You have to get elected, right? Or elect people that you know respond to consultations, be participate in the regulation to take control of the regulation. That's the best way. And, um, and support your colleagues who are seeking election by helping them get elected if you think that they're going to be good and fair and clever about their decision making. And then support them in their decisions as well. Thanks for that answer, Shenda. I have a question for you as um, I, I, well, as a member of the profession, I'm going to ask you this question. You talked briefly about AGMs and, um, and how colleges hold AGMs. Some colleges do, as I already said, PT Alberta does not. When we think about the role of the college and we think about um, the fact that this is about serving the public, as you've said, and not serving the interests of the profession. It, it seems a bit uneasy to think about having an AGM. So I wondered if you could offer uh, your thoughts on that subject. 
Oh yeah, I think they're terrible. I think I think that Manitoba um, still has them. Not for all of the health professions, maybe, but I think they send the wrong um, message to registrants that regulations are democracy, and it's not that. It's expert informed decision making. But Leanne, you've been in this business for a long time. You are better at making, you're a qualified professional in regulation as well as being a physiotherapist. And so if I want physiotherapy, well, I don't know when the last time you practiced was, but if you're like lots of my colleagues and you haven't practiced for a long time, maybe you're not going to be the best person for me to go to the next time I um, wreck my Achilles tendon, but I'm going right to you for advice about regulation. And I think the role of registrants is to make sure they're, they're very, very welcome to share their opinion. I think that it's important for a regulator to take their opinions into account, especially for things like setting standards or making decisions about um, ethics or registration thresholds. All of those things you need to hear from the profession about because they're the experts. But then the board needs to make that decision, taking into account all the other evidence too, what the public thinks, what the government's demanding, what the new science is evolving towards. So AGMs make you feel like you should get to vote on whether or not those fee increases are appropriate. And you might do like the engineers in Quebec did and, and make the wrong decision. Fair enough. Yeah, please don't come to me if you wreck your Achilles tendon because that's <laughs> not where my skills are anymore. Um, Shanda, I have you, you touched on labor mobility and fair practices, and those are words that we've heard a lot about in the recent, well, the last 18 months. And I, I know you know what I'm referring to, of course, but can you talk a little bit about those pieces of legislation? And, you know, you touched on them, but they're getting thrown, uh, those. Those words are getting thrown around a lot, and I don't know if, as a collective group, we necessarily understand what what that's all about. So, can you elaborate a little bit on that? I, and I'm sorry if I'm sort of throwing you under the bus here because it's a you know a big broad question in the last five minutes of this talk. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, so, I'm remembering when the Fairness Commissioner got appointed in Ontario probably 15 or 20 years ago, and I was working then for the College of Physicians and Surgeons. And the accusation was that we were treating um, internationally educated doctors unfairly by not automatically giving them licenses. So the Fairness Commissioner began to impose restrictions on the restrictions that we were allowed to impose. So it came close to them telling us we needed to recognize the degrees and the practice in other jurisdictions without looking deeper at whether those were applicable in Ontario. So if you think about a doctor who practiced in a remote town in India, he or she wouldn't have had access to the same prescription medications, the same diagnostic tools, a whole range of stuff that a, a Canadian educated physician would take for granted. So it isn't that the Indian physician was inferior, but it is that they probably needed some additional help before they were suitable to practice in Canada. So that's the fairness piece, the fair practices piece. And again, coming back to the value of self-regulation, figuring out what people need to know to practice in your area is probably down to you knowing what needs to be done to practice well. Labor mobility is related but slightly different. And again, 10 years ago, it was that if you got your license in Alberta, 
first, you would need to go through the registration process from the very beginning again in Ontario if you wanted to move. And Ontario could say no if they wanted to for whatever reason they might have. Possibly, if you were internationally educated, maybe Alberta recognizes your training and Ontario decides not to. In the interest of the Canadian economy, the government, the federal government there intervened and said, no, wait a minute, you jurisdictions need to trust each other. So somebody who is registered in um, Alberta is guaranteed to be accepted in Ontario. That's the bottom line of what those words mean. So what does it mean right now, today, for physiotherapy in Canada? It means when we look at the national competency exam, which I know is the underlying theme uh, to your question, Leanne, it means that the jurisdictions need to work together to figure out this problem about the qualifying exam so that the internationally educated and those who are qualified in other jurisdictions all come into practice with the same ability to deliver quality care. You need to figure out a way to assure yourselves of that. Whether the bar is too high right now or too low in some provinces, that's the really, really tricky question. Um, that's what the negotiation going to have to be about, but that's how those things connect. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it absolutely does. Thanks, Shenda. That's a great answer to that question. Um, we are pretty much at the end of our time, and, and I don't have any other questions coming in from the audience. So um, I think at, with that in mind and just respecting everybody's time, I'm going to draw the webinar to a close. I thank you all for being here today. And Shenda, thanks for an excellent talk. This was uh, this is very interesting to me as a regulator, but hopefully our, our registrants also um, really uh, gained some in additional insight into the world of regulation as well. And, and certainly we have uh, um, uh, we have people expressing their thanks in the chat pod. So thank you again, everybody. And with that, we'll say goodbye until next month's pro uh, presentation. So have a great day, everyone. <laughs>